Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. Great to have you with us on this Wednesday. Dave Revson and Trent Meacham. A little bit of an abbreviated schedule tonight, obviously, with the Northwestern Iowa game being postponed due to the COVID outbreak in the Wildcats team, but still plenty to talk about. Trent. Plenty to talk about. Every game is just seems to get better and better. And what I've loved in, in the past couple of days, Purdue, Michigan State, Wisconsin, um, last night as well, these games are coming down the wire. And executing yes. in the clutch is, is all the difference now. A lot of close games yeah. in the Big Ten this year. And uh, we saw one of those again last night. To your point, that is our big story. It is that game I was fortunate enough to be at in Madison last evening as Wisconsin halts at a three-game skid. Topping Penn State by three, a game the Nittany Lions actually led by six at the half, but Wisconsin hit five of its last seven down the stretch to pull out the win. Then Andrew Funk missed a three that would have tied it in the waning seconds. Nittany Lions have still never won at the Kohl Center. They are now 0 and 19, but they have, man, they've been close. I've actually done the games the last two years. They lost by two last year, they lose by three. Last night, what are your takeaways from the game we saw? There's a few. I think to start, Tyler Wall being back is huge. You can't uh, put too much weight on that. I, I believe Stephen Bardo in the opening of the game s talked about the psychological impact. Yep. And then at the end of the game, Greg Gard, I think, used that same word, psychological. Um, how that impacts his team, how that benefits his team. There's been so much on the shoulders of Chucky Hepburn and Stephen Crowell. Both those guys are playing well, having fantastic seasons. I love Crowell's emergence and development. But when you don't have – Wall's your, your, your leading scorer, kind of a go-to guy, and also on the defensive end, he's so versatile. So j just having him back on the court, the fact that he played over 30 minutes, I wasn't expecting that. That yeah. really, I think, bodes well for them. Getting him back in the fold and then, again, closing the game. They were fantastic down the stretch. We just heard five for seven in closing that game. I, I thought – you talk about how, how do you win these close games like, like Wisconsin always does. How do, why does that happen to them? Taking care of the ball, playing solid defense, contesting every shot, and then executing down the stretch. And I just thought their execution was fantastic. Out of timeouts, they had Stephen Crowell for a deep post uh, bucket. The next timeout, get Crowell in the post. They run this split action. Run, run some great stuff for Connor Seijan. He gets loose for a three. Get stops on the other end. Chucky Hepburn, huge uh, offensive foul drawn on Jalen Pickett. Knockdown free throws. I mean... It's that execution, that discipline down the stretch. And once again, Wisconsin was there and, and, and made those plays. Fifth win by three points or fewer. So to your point, they win these close games. That is the most for any power conference team. It is interesting to see the impact that Wall has. And, and you mentioned the 33 minutes that Greg Gard told me before the game. I said, you know, what are you thinking in terms of minutes? He said, well, it'll be kind of a, a pitch count of sorts. We'll see. Throw that pitch count out yeah, the window when how he's you get in the guts of the game. Down the yeah. floor, but clearly he was doing fine, and I think they left some of it in Tyler Wall's hands just to give them a sense of how he was feeling, and it was pretty clear that, that he was all right. And he does make a huge difference, and we were talking about it during the game. They were averaging nine fewer points per game without him than with him, and their opponents were scoring nine more points per game. So you're talking a net 18-point difference for the games that he played in and the games that he didn't play in. Again, it's not just his scoring. It's not just his defense. To your point, it is his presence. I mean, this is an all Big Ten player in the preseason, and you get a sense of the importance he has to this team. Uh, both ends of the floor, and, and Bruce Weber actually said last night on the big show, I think, that other teams have to account for him. So even if he's not scoring in, he didn't light the world on fire. He clearly you know, doesn't have his rhythm, didn't have his best game, but just his, him on the floor – his leadership, his confidence. I mean, that bleeds into his teammates and really big for them. And also, Max Klesman not playing that second half. They started Tyler Wall and Jalen Pickett. Initially, I thought, oh, wow, this is a great matchup. And he did a really good job for a few minutes. And then Pickett kind of had his way. But to have that body on the floor, and, and I just think it's, it's fantastic that he was able to play that many minutes in, in a tight game. And, I mean, that's huge for Wisconsin because they don't have a, a huge margin of error like some teams that might have a little bit more depth. They need all their guys playing at a high level. What did you make of Penn State's performance? A picket once again was fantastic. Wisconsin did a nice job of limiting their threes, a team that averages 11 threes per game. That is the most in the Big Ten among the top dozen, dozen in the nation. They hit eight threes. It, it felt like Wisconsin was kind of wheeling to – let Pickett work one-on-one -on -one in the post and, and hit a few of those layups, but not give up those 
pass outs for the threes. Yeah, Pickett was Pickett, 19, 12, and 6. Uh, and, and that's the, the name of the game when you play Penn State. They're averaging 11, over 11 threes a game. They shoot a very high percentage. Only eight. They went three for 11 in the second half. I thought especially in the second half, Wisconsin really tightened up, contested threes. The first half, I thought they were overhelping a bit more. And Penn State is going to space you, and they have more marksmen and, and deadly marksmen than any other team in the league. And Wisconsin got caught overhelping a little bit more. you got to be – a little bit more tight to your man against against Penn State. In the second half, they did a much better job. And, you know, Penn State missed some shots. Uh, Andrew Funk, they run some great stuff for Andrew Funk. I thought it was it was really fun watching the, the actions that Wisconsin runs for a season and the actions that Penn State runs for Andrew Funk. A lot of times you'll see these shooters be the screener. And if you're guarding a shooter, you know, all we can practice, coach has been like, hey, you can't let him get loose. And so then he sets a back screen and the opponent gets free a little bit and you're kind of in your head, do I stick with this shooter? I remember being in that position against like a John Diebler, and you don't want him to get going, and, but then you may, might give up a layup on the back screen. And so they run some great stuff. I thought Andrew Fuck was ghosting some screens where he'd come up to set a screen and then slip out of it. That really threw Wisconsin off a bit. They missed some shots down the stretch. Cameron Winter missed some shots. Really, Miles um, Dredd had that one three, but otherwise it was Pickett and Funk that entire second half. And a big blow for them was Seth Lundy never got going. Coming off a great game Ball against, was an issue. yeah, he never never got into the flow of a game. Had 25 against Indiana, was seven made threes, and they need him to make some plays because he's having a very good year as well. So this is a Penn State. This is what you want. You're on the road against a very good team. You have opportunities to win. Wisconsin made those shots, those plays down the stretch. The one thing I'd say is. When they were down one with the ball, under 30 seconds left, they get the ball to pick it in the post. And they ran a great action, kind of a screen away and, and, and coming back for Andrew Funk. Had a good look to go up two. I would have liked to seen Pickett just wheel and deal and go to work. And he, had, he was so mm -hmm. effective in that position where unless they double him, then you kick it out. Otherwise, I'd like to see him, would, would have liked to seen him force the issue a bit there. His array of post moves for a guard is just really So amazing. fun to watch. He is a really fun player to watch. Again, I, I know I've harped on this a lot on this show, but it is his uniqueness. It is that he is such an unusual player, and he, you know his history, right? I mean, he, he did not start as a point guard. He went to Siena as a forward, and they had a player get injured, their point guard, and they said, well, you know, let's see how this works out with Jalen Pickett, and obviously becomes just you know, one of the best point guards in America. So pretty fascinating the, the way the world works. But uh, a tough loss for Penn State. Again, they're trying to be the team that kind of breaks through. Can you, can you do things that no one else has done before? Micah Shrewsbury tried to use that as a rallying cry for his team, the fact they had never won at the Kohl Center, and they still have not. Ohio State and Nebraska tonight are one game this evening. The Buckeyes have lost four straight games, Trent. I mean, you don't want to necessarily pull the alarm here. Other than the home loss to Minnesota, I think the other three kind of taken in isolation. None of them are particularly concerning. The issue is that they've all happened together. And, and so I think kind of as a collective group of losses, it makes you wonder a little bit about what's going on with the Buckeyes. What's your sense as they head into this game at Pinnacle Bank? You know, they're really close to being 3-1 and one in those games. Yes. You know, a couple weeks ago, I thought maybe this is the second best team in the Big Ten Conference, and they've dro dropped those four straight. And it's just it shows how tight these games come down to. And we talk about Wisconsin's ability to execute down the stretch. I mean, they were one turnover away from beating Purdue. They had that game in the fold. Uh, Rutgers, they had opportunities to win down the stretch, and Bryce Sensiball missed a three down the stretch. I thought Minnesota is the one game that really um, was concerning to me, and it was interesting because that was a game where, where Chris Holtman and Ben Johnson were mic'd up the entire game. Yes. So a little bit of a different viewing yeah. experience. But from the opening jump, Chris Holtman was just imploring his team to push the pace, play with urgency, uh, play faster, contest shots. And I just felt like he was, he was trying to will the team to, to play uh, with more urgency, with more intensity, but he's on the sideline. You know, he's the coach. You know, I think they, they need a player to kind of step up hmm. in, in that leadership way, one with a voice, kind of get them going, and then two with their action. And, and that can look a number of different ways, but I, I, but I, I didn't see that in that game. Um, obviously, they haven't closed out those games, and maybe it's just the bounce of a ball, but – we haven't seen them really come through in, in those moments, and that's where I want to see someone step up, 
dive on the floor for a loose ball, you know, stop a run, uh, pick up 94 feet, and just get their team going in some way. And, and that would be my biggest concern for them. Ohio State, this is the longest losing streak of any team in the conference right now. It, hard to it's believe. Hard to believe, because yeah. Because just as you said, I mean, it's a few weeks ago, you look at Ohio State and think this might be the second best team in the league. And part of that is just the nature of the, the Big Ten this year. But, but as you said, Four straight losses, all of them by single-digit margins, some of them against really good teams. So it's not unreasonable to say this could still be one of the elite teams in the league, despite what we've seen here over the last couple weeks. Trying to get right here in Lincoln against a Huskers team that was shorthanded. I actually thought gave Purdue a pretty good battle on Friday night in West Lafayette, considering they were playing without Juwan Gary, and it seems like that's going to be a little bit of a longer-term thing. But also without Sam Griesel, who is a point guard. He himself is kind of an unusual player, one who can control the pace a little bit. Didn't have him. Sounds like they hope to have him back for this game. What are you thinking as you look at the Huskers right now? Well, they definitely need Sam Griesel back, I think, to be competitive in this league. Uh, when they have him and Derek Walker playing at a high level, uh, this team – can surprise some people because they have two guys that they can facilitate the offense through that can score for themselves, that can facilitate for their teammates. They need a third guy to step up. So, unfortunately, Jawan Gary's out. When he's in double figures, they're 7-1. You know, there's another guy, C.J. Wiltshire. When he's in double figures, they're 6-1. They need a third guy to step up because they really just struggle on that offensive end of the floor. Uh, they're shooting 30% from three, only six made threes a game. So, they're not getting much uh, from the perimeter. And they need – so they'll need Greasel and Walker to play at a high level. And they need – is it Tomanaga? Is it – we've seen Breidenbach in situations. Is it uh, Bandumel? They need someone else to make some shots to really give them – take some of that pressure off Walker and Greasel. Uh, and then, of course, they got to be sound defensively. They got their work cut out for them because – uh, Justice Suing, Bryce Sensiball is on a tear, and somebody's going to have to stop those guys in one-on-one -on -one situations. The strength of this group is defending, and Fred Hoiberg has really gotten them to buy in on that end of the court where maybe they hadn't with different groups in previous years. But to your point, this is a really big challenge. Ohio yes. State, as we know, one of the most efficient offenses in the country. Some big news for Maryland football. Quarterback Talia Tungabailoa says he is coming back for another year. In three seasons under center as a Terp, Lee has thrown for nearly 8,000 yards, more than 50 TDs. Already has the school records in both of those categories. Terps won eight games this year. They've won back-to-back -back bowl games. A lot has happened since we last really dove into football on this show. Conference is in the market for a new commissioner. Kevin Warren headed to the Bears. Jim Harbaugh sticking around in Ann Arbor after considering a jump to the NFL. His star running back returning as well. Brian Hartline, the new OC in Columbus, replacing the departed Kevin Wilson, needs a new QB. C.J. Stroud is NFL bound. We need someone to make sense of all of this for us, and Stu Mandel from The Athletic is just the guy to do it. Hello, Stuart. Uh, let's start with Harbaugh. Second straight year that we have seen these rumors after this season, of course, made the college football playoff both years ultimately decided to return to Michigan. Is it your sense this is going to be an every year thing where he's going to feel out what other opportunities might be out there? Or do you think he's closed the door once and for all? Yeah, and until he stops taking these interviews, that the rumors, if you will, are going to continue to be out there. And, um, you know, who knows? Or we don't really know this year if this year's situation was, you know, last year it was very clear. He wanted that Vikings job. He interviewed on signing day. He didn't get it. Was this this one that he didn't see an opportunity that was going to present itself, or he uh, didn't like the opportunities out there? We don't know. But if they win at a high level again this year, I would assume there will be interest again next year from the NFL. If you were watching the NFL playoffs this weekend, there were a lot of really you know mid late thirties, fairly inexperienced head coaches. You could see why NFL teams would would covet a guy who has that experience and won at a high level in the NFL and is now doing it again in college. Is it your sense that he has actually been offered anything? I mean, you mentioned last year the Vikings clearly didn't offer him the job. Was there anything that was that you know of that was kind of a formal opportunity this year where he could have said yes and jumped? Or was it simply taking his name out of the running when he was one of the candidates? Because as we know, the NFL handles this a lot differently than, than college teams do. I mean, there's much more of a, a process. You don't just hire someone overnight 
What's your sense of how far along some of this stuff was this year? Well, that's a great point you made. The college coaching carousel is so um, dysfunctional, to put it mildly. <laughs> how strange, given actually how functional been... the, the rest of the sport is, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, nobody, no, everybody's always only ever offered one candidate. Uh, yeah. Nobody got that, that didn't get the job, had an offer. And we all know that's not the case. But in the NFL, they really do have a formal interview process. By all indications, the Broncos were going to continue to interview candidates whether Harbaugh had, had stayed in the mix or not. So whether he was told he's not getting it or he didn't want to wait it out or just didn't think that was the right opportunity, I don't know. Um, but no, to, as far as I know, he has not been offered an NFL job and turned it down. Mentioned they do have a bunch of guys coming back. Blake Corum is obviously the headliner, but Zach Sinner, uh, Cornelius Johnson, uh, Trevor Keegan, uh, the list kind of, goes on and on with them. It really feels like they're well positioned. Uh, they've won the league two years in a row now. Are they the team to beat in your estimation heading into next year? Yeah, I mean, I think the the you know, if you watch the playoff games, you would say, oh, Ohio State is still the more talented team. They took Georgia right to the wire, whereas Michigan lost at home to or lost to TCU. But at the end of the day, Michigan's beaten Ohio State soundly the last two years. It's hard to say they're not the be they haven't been the better team. They will have that window next year, and they bring back and I think this is a big deal. JJ McCarthy. Everybody just assumes Ohio State's got another first round quarterback sitting there waiting to take over for CJ Stroud, but we don't know that. Uh, we haven't seen those guys yet, so I do give a slight edge to Michigan, and I would also say. I think Penn State is ready to be in that mix this year as well after several years where they were clearly um, a step or two behind those two. It is fascinating to look at Ohio State because, as you say, Michigan has beaten them soundly two years in a row, and yet they literally were one play away on several occasions from beating Georgia, and it's hard to imagine that if they would have beaten Georgia, they wouldn't have beaten TCU, although obviously they lost right. to Michigan, and, and Michigan lost to TCU, but, but just the way that that Georgia dismantled them. So it would have been a strange scenario if you were coming off of a, a national championship and still had <laughs> lost two in a row to the Wolverines, a, a problem I know Buckeyes fans would love to have. You mentioned Penn State. I, I was at the Rose Bowl. They're really impressive. They've got young talent. I know everyone's excited about Drew Aller, although Sean Clifford was certainly really good in that game and got his first win against a top 10 team in his career. But so much young talent, the running backs, Abdul Carter had such a good year. It feels like this team is poised to take the next step. Are they a notch below those other two only because they lost to them this year and you'll believe it when you see it? Or is there more to it? You still think there's a talent gap between Penn State and Michigan and Ohio State? When I did my um, early top 25 the day after the championship game, or went up the day after the championship game, it was Michigan 2, Ohio State 3, Penn State 6. So, obviously, I don't think there's that big a gap. I think, obviously, Penn State has to prove it. It's been a long time since they beat Ohio State. Um, they haven't uh, been – they weren't competitive with Michigan this past season. But like you said, they were a very young team. And even so, we saw great contributions from several of those freshmen. Now, a current freshman will be taking over a quarterback. And there's a lot of other guys in that, that great recruiting class James Franklin had – that we're expecting to step into big roles next year. Also, they just got one of the best, if not the best receivers in the transfer portal, a guy from Kent State. So um, I think they're I think they're ready to contend. You know, Sean Clifford set a lot of records at Penn State, but it's no secret. He was up and down. I think he had a ceiling. I don't think he was going to be the guy that took them to the college football playoff. Now, you never know. Five-star freshmen, some of them turn out to be Trevor Lawrence. Some of them you never really hear from again. But everybody in the program is very high on Drew. And um, if he lives up to that hype, I, I could definitely see them, you know, um, taking that next step. And it feels like we saw just enough this year to give you a sense that he probably will live up to at least some uh, of that hype. That he's certainly very capable of playing at this level. I was in Madison last night covering the basketball game, and it is just amazing the buzz there, Stu, that Luke Fickle has provided, how excited people are about this new offense, and, and Phil Longo, and kind of running this modified version, I guess, of the air raid. I mean, it's unclear exactly what it's going to look like. Iowa's made some big moves in the portal. As we look at the West, 
Uh, are those the two that kind of stand out? You know, I know people are excited in Lincoln, too, with Matt Rule. How do you see all this playing out? Yeah, I mean, Iowa, obviously, that the issue the last couple of years has been the offense. So I think the fact that they were able to go out and get Cade McNamara, who started for a college, you know, a Michigan team that went to the playoff, um, you know, is definitely a good sign there. They're, they're, they should be very good on defense again. The Wisconsin thing is fascinating. I never thought I'd see the day that receivers in the portal are flocking <laughs> to Madison. Uh, you know, the guy, a receiver from USC, excited to be going to Wisconsin. Um, obviously, Tanner Mordecai comes in there from SMU, uh, who's thrown for a whole lot of yards. So there's no question Wisconsin is going to be more exciting than they have been in a long time. Um, there is a lot more of things to be interested about whether they can make, and it's a, it's a big transformation, right. To go from the style of football they played for 30 years to the air raid. And, and to be clear, air raid doesn't mean throw it every play. Like Mike Leach's teams did. They Phil Longo had some great running backs at UNC. He will definitely take advantage of Braylon Allen, uh, at Wisconsin, but it's a big change. So who that's, that would be the question. You know, I, I think, They've made it an upgrade talent-wise. There's excitement, but but do those guys pick up that system and do they fit that system so quickly to have an immediate impact next season? Or is it going to take Luke Fickle, you know, more than one season to get things going there? To your point, though, the buzz and just the type of players that are transferring there, they've got yeah. three transfer quarterbacks in one class, right? I mean, some places you're happy to get one. They, they've gotten three, and it doesn't seem like anyone's – Afraid of the competition, 13 scholarship transfers in all. Really remarkable story developing. Hey, I do want to touch on Kevin Warren's departure. I want to spin it forward more, though, with you. I just think it's really interesting as you assess what's going on in college athletics right now. We have seen a couple of conferences hire commissioners, the Pac-12 and the Big 12, namely, who have gone outside of the traditional college sports structure and have hired people who come from different backgrounds, some who have kind of, you know, marketing and kind of creating buzz around their product. And, and it feels like that maybe to a certain extent is what the Pac-12 and the Big 12 need. The Big 10 does not need that, right? The Big 10 has plenty of buzz yeah. sitting in a great position along with the SEC. But yet there is kind of this, there has been this movement, right, of these non-traditional hires. Kevin Warren, in a lot of ways, was a non-traditional hire coming from the NFL, whereas... In the ACC and the SEC, you have people who have been more lifers in college athletics or, or people who have strong college athletic backgrounds. W what is the resume you think of the person who the Big Ten ends up hiring? Is it someone who comes from a traditional background or is it someone who comes from outside of this current structure? I don't see why it would be somebody of the Kleofkoff, um, Brett Yormark background because those two conferences – hired a commissioner right before they were going into media rights negotiations. The Big Tens is set now, obviously. Uh, they just announced, you know, it'll go into effect this coming year. So if you're looking at the, you know, say, hey, the new Big Ten commissioner, what are his priorities going to be? First one, obviously, getting USC and UCLA situated in the conference, um, uh, making sure they, they feel, you know, like they know what's going on at the other 14 schools or, you know, have good relationships with them. But the single biggest challenge, and I would assume the presidents will look at it this way, is the changes that are coming. We've already had a lot of changes to college sports. There are going to be even more over the next few years. And most notably, you know, the fight that is going to go on in the next couple of years is the fight over whether athletes are going to become classified as employees. And so knowing that, you know, I could see an argument for a, a somebody currently in college sports for that that first part about USC and UCLA and making sure everybody gets along. I do think that was a weakness of Kevin Warren's. But I could also see following in the footsteps of the NCAA, who for their new president, Charlie Baker, Charlie Baker was the governor of Massachusetts, decided given the challenges that we're facing right now in the courts, possibly in, in Congress, we need somebody with a political background. It would make sense for the Big Ten to do something similar. I don't have a name for you that fits that profile, but I think that is going to be for all of the Power Five commissioners. They're going to be spending a lot of time over the next few years dealing with some of those existential issues. And so if I'm the Big Ten presidents, do I say, do I want someone who's already in the establishment to help me figure that out or somebody who's coming in from the outside 
who has experience dealing with those issues, even if they aren't necessarily um, college sports issues. Fascinating time. It's been really interesting to see what direction they go and what this entire enterprise looks like five years from now, because uh, the, the change we've seen in the last five years has been staggering. Stu, thanks a lot for making sense of it all for us. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Dave. Our big stat looking at Streets School, how the Hawkeyes have turned things around after an 0-3 conference start. The offense has been dramatically better in this stretch. Can win a lot of games hitting better than 41% from three. Efficiency numbers are off the charts. They're better on the glass as well. Uh, Iowa has improved dramatically. Illinois has improved dramatically as well as Trent rejoins. I want to talk about both of them because these are teams that both started 0 and 3 in the Big Ten. Let's start with Iowa just because we, we had them there. What do you think has changed here? How do you go from losing to Eastern Illinois and then losing two more games subsequent to that to where they are now, where they're rolling? Just want to touch on how bad they looked there for a couple weeks. The Eastern Illinois game was dreadful. Um, gave up 92 points. Yes. Gave up 83 to Penn State. Nebraska just really just beat them very soundly in Lincoln. I mean, things did not look good. And then, you know, Patrick McCaffrey, one of their best players, stepping away. I mean, I thought, oh, boy. And then Indiana comes to town. They're up by 20 I mean, a few yeah. minutes into the game. It looked really bleak. I mean, dead in the water, this team. And, you know, I, I think there's a number of things. One player that's really emerged is Peyton Sanford, who there was big talk about him in the offseason, struggled to find his rhythm, struggled to find his shot. I was expecting big things after what he did as a freshman, you know, very confident player, high release point, big guard, 6'7 or so, can get his shot off and just struggled. You could see his confidence not there. And man, as he emerged. I mean, big time, especially in the second half in recent games at Rutgers on the road, at home against Michigan, he's been, been massive for them. And then you add in Chris Murray's just been He's been consistently great all season, so he's continued that. Brach has been very good. So this team just has that flow, that rhythm now. Uh, Sanford's that one guy, but I think um, just something switched for them, and they've really turned it up. I mean, to go from 0 for 19 from the field <laughs> as Sanford was, 24 of his last 41. Incredible. I mean, it's 0 of 19. It's, it's just, it really is staggering for someone who shoots the ball as well as he does. They're second in the na nation in offensive efficiency in this four-game stretch during They're this fun to watch. winning yeah. streak. They, they really are fun. What about Illinois? Is there a common thread at all with Illinois and Iowa? Well, I, I touched on a couple maybe um, in, you know, specific things for Illinois first because uh, they have changed their, their scheme schemes a little bit offensively, trying to, you know, they're, they're running Brad Underwood's old spread offense and, and giving some more structure in the half court. Defensively, they're not switching now in their man-to-man -man defense. That's been much better. I, I think a big thing for them, though, is – with Sky Clark now stepping away, kind of in somewhat similar fashion to Patrick McCaffrey, the roles are more clearly defined, and I think for both teams. And for Illinois in particular, now the ball is in the hands of Terrence Shannon, Matt My Meyer, Jaden Epps. That's who has the ball, and I think those are those three most gifted scores. I know Dane Dane just had some moments there, but the, the, the roles are clear. You have the ball in the hands of guys who can make plays, especially for themselves. All those guys are wired to score. And, and both these teams have that luxury of having great depth, okay? And sometimes that can go both ways, and you're trying to find rhythm and rotations. I think it's, it's more clearly uh, defined now, and both of them are playing great in, in that aspect. But I'd also say more broad or kind of from a higher level, both these teams, Illinois, I didn't mention, I mean, they looked, you know, dead in the water as well. They did not look good. I mean, Missouri just totally ran them out the gym there right before Christmas, uh, you know, then they go to Northwestern, and Northwestern beats them soundly. Brad Underwood's going crazy. I mean, it's just yeah. – it, it looked like this is not going in a, in a good direction and, and give a ton of credit to the coaching staff on both staffs. But those players and, – and, you know, we, we, we see that preview for the Chris Street story, and, and thankfully nothing like that has happened. But I think sometimes when, um, you know, your teammate, you know, or, or your brother, you know, Patrick McCaffrey steps away, Sky Clark steps away – that can do something to you. When something happens off the court, I think there can be a uh, – your, your team can come together from, a, from a, in, in a sense. I think you can possibly have a, a greater appreciation just to be able to play this game. I think sometimes basketball or your sport can be it, – it consumes your life. Mm -hmm. It's everything. What ha Does that round ball, does it go in or out? I mean, can, can so much can depend on that. And when you, you see something that happens away from the court – I think give you a healthier perspective to the game. And I don't know exactly what's going on with both these teams, but I know for me, sometimes 
those off the court things can make you realize, hey, this isn't everything. So let me appreciate this opportunity even more. Let me kind of let go of the outcome. Let me tune out the noise. I mean, who cares about the superficial stuff? And that can allow you to play much more free, loose, uh, with more joy. And typically, kind of when you forget about the end result, you play better. And there's something that's happened in these two teams. I mean, they're playing inspired basketball. They're playing for each other. It seems like they're not worried about the wrong things. And so it's just great to see how those two teams have come together in what looked like a really kind of bleak time for both of them. A pretty interesting perspective there. And, and again, I think that's something from the point of view of a player that maybe you see it through a, a little bit different lens than than the fans do. But obviously, as you say, there is a lot more to this yeah. than, than just basketball. On the basketball front, two big home games coming up for Illinois here. Indiana and Ohio State, we'll see whether or not they can keep their momentum going. Big Ten women's hoops, Ohio State still on top, one of three remaining unbeatens nationally. Indiana and Iowa, just a game behind them with Illinois, Michigan, and Maryland, all two games back. The top six teams in the country, as you can see, all ranked in the top 21 nationally. Big Ten Network analyst Autumn Johnson is joining us now. Uh, Autumn, how wide open do you think this race is? I think there's a perception maybe among some that Ohio State is – a little bit above those other teams and maybe it's just the perception of that zero in the loss column but they certainly have played some very competitive games had a couple they easily could have lost in the league do you think it's Ohio State and everyone else or, or is this a closer race maybe than people understand well that 18 and 0 record for Ohio State also includes four ranked wins and I know the Buckeyes are only seven games into conference play but they've proved that they are the team to beat right now they have the target on their backs however they are playing in a tough Big Ten conference as we saw six of the top 25 teams in the Big Ten the most representation um, they have to play Iowa they have to play Indiana twice Maryland twice Michigan again which they already defeated so it won't be easy down the stretch going into conference play for Ohio State I'm going to keep my eyes closed next week for sure because they're going to play Iowa and Indiana in the same week so that alone will let us know what we need to know I think anything can happen in the Big Ten I mean you're going up against heavyweight champs every single night but I still think it is Ohio State's to win. I mean, just they just have the defense and offense to do so. And this team is clicking so well together. Top five offense, top five in steals, and then also top five in turnover margin. And that ranks nationally. So Ohio State, they have proven that they're the teams to beat. But we'll see down the stretch um, if they can take it all the way. To your point, though, Iowa and Indiana, those are huge games next week. Yeah. You, you win both of those in addition to beating Northwestern this week, who is really uncharacteristically struggling this year. Then all of a sudden, I mean, if you're 21 and 0, I mean, then then you're you're really turning some heads. So we'll see. Big, big week next week. The marquee matchup tonight is Indiana and Illinois. Really excited about this one. We had Terry Morin on yesterday. She was singing the praises of what Illinois has done with Shauna Green and this remarkable turnaround. They played last month. It was a close game in Bloomington that the Hoosiers were able to pull out. Now they go to Champaign. Should be a tremendous atmosphere. What are you watching in this one? Yeah, I, I'm very excited about this matchup. I think Illinois is going to give Indiana another run for their money. But what I'm looking out for is how Illinois can use their winning formula again. Defense, rebound, and run. And we saw that in everything and more when they played Indiana the first time around, only fell by four points. They held one of the top offenses in the Big Ten to only 65 points. They're used to averaging about 81 points per game. They rebounded well and actually out-rebounded the Hoosiers by six, and they always capitalized in transition when was able to to help the, that game of runs with Indiana. So if they hold true to these keys, I feel like they can edge this one out. However, the difference for Indiana this time around is Grace Berger is back, which provides another facilitator, another double-figure scorer, a two-way player, and just overall a seasoned veteran. This Indiana team is much better with Grace Berger on the court, but Illinois, they're still a very skilled team, so I'm excited to see how this one shakes out. Uh, Indiana's won 14 straight in this series, but again, this is an Illinois team that is dramatically different than the ones we've seen as recently as a year ago. They're both fun, up-tempo teams, averaging more than 80 points per game. Really should be a, a phenomenal game. Uh, we did wait a bit to really take a deep dive into the Buckeyes, and I, I do want to do that. You touched on them and, and maybe how they have separated themselves a, a little bit. But just in terms of the job that Kevin McGuff has done here, I mean, 
you don't have Madison Green again, which is a huge disappointment for her. I mean, it's just hard not to to feel heartbroken for her to, to have a second straight year disrupted by injury. J.C. Sheldon out as well. It, it's just kind of mind-boggling that you lose two key players at the same position and that mm -hmm. you're as good as they are. I'm mean, to be number two in the country. What does it tell us about Kevin McGuff and, and his skill as a head coach? Yeah, as you mentioned right there, I mean, losing two point guards is tough. I mean, someone that runs your offense so smoothly and also are two two-way players, they should sell in also Mass and Green. They know the system. They know what Coach McGuff wants out of them. But despite injury, despite um, adversity. This team is still the number two team in the country, which is best in program history. They've consistently been a top five offense in the country. As I mentioned, top five in steals and turnovers. Coach McGuff deserves his flowers. He's been doing incredible from this season. And I honestly think it starts back from their last year's run to the Sweet 16. That was their first year acquiring Taylor Mike Sell. She had to get into the system, gain some chemistry along her teammates. And now she knows Coach McGuff's system. He's put her in a position to succeed. She always has the green light. She's a three-point shooting threat. And now she's increased her game as a defensive nightmare as well. So that was huge for this team. And also returning Taylor Theory, Rebecca Mikolashikova, and it helped elevate their game. Recruiting Cody McMahon, who's a freshman and having a standout first year. These are talented players, but I honestly think it comes down to the coach which creating an identity um, to kind of maximize their skill sets and then also putting your positions, players in positions to succeed. I mean, they're 18 and 0, which includes four ranked wins, which is not easy, especially without those top players. And I think that coach McGuff will be in the uh, coach of the year conversation when it's all said and done, because he has this team prepared every single night, despite what he doesn't have. And again, Iowa and Indiana coming up next week. And of course, when you play Iowa, you're talking about Caitlin Clark, and Caitlin Clark led the nation, as everyone knows, in scoring and rebounding last year. She's in the top, uh, or scoring and assists, I should say, last year. She's in the top four in both categories this season. For people who maybe don't follow this sport beyond the Big Ten, like where does she fit in the National Player of the Year race right now? Is she the front runner? Yep. Are there others we should be keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think she ranks right at the top with the very best. I mean, yes, you have Caitlin Clark, but you also have defending national player of the year and defensive player of the year, Leah Boston, once again, as a front runner. And then another sleeper pick that have been, has, who has entered into the chat is Angel Reese. Uh, but Caitlin Clark, out of all of them, uh, they're all playing their top game. And I think anyone can walk away with that type of hardware. But we know what Cape, uh, Caitlin Clark is capable of on the offensive end, no doubt. But I think what's going to make her stand out even more in the National Player of the Year conversation is her game on the defensive end. And I think that was the difference maker when you looked at last year's race. But if you look at this season for Caitlin Clark, her game has grown into a two-way player. She's actually leading her team in blocks and steals, which is very impressive for a guard. So if she continues to do that, continues to have some consistency, help her team achieve um, greater than last year. I think she could be a front runner for sure, but she's definitely amongst those top three. And um, those are the conversations that's been happening around the league. She is remarkable, and we are fortunate to have her in the Big Ten among a group of superstars. This is a star-studded league. You also, as people who follow the sport know, are an expert in bracketology. So, Autumn, give us a sense right now. I mean, clearly those top six Big Ten teams our NCAA tourney teams. How many in total do you think are in the hunt right now? Yeah, I mean, when I came in, um, I initially had six Big Ten teams in my bracket for preseason, but now I have seven with the addition of Illinois breaking in and making some national noise. Yeah, I've been keeping a close eye on Michigan State and Purdue, who's been able to get some quality wins underneath their belt. But I've been really impressed with Illinois so far. I mean, I have them as high as a six seed right now with a 15 and three record. Um, they're undefeated at home. They beat that uh, tough Iowa Hawkeyes team very like just last month. But they played Indiana and Ohio State very close, which I think the selection committee will take into consideration. I definitely took that into consideration. So I'm excited to see. I mean, they have some really quality games in front of them that can help them get a little bit higher. So we'll see if they can continue to rise. But 
just the top six already in the top 25 is a testament of how tough this league is. So we'll see how it all plays out. But I see those six teams staying in there for sure. So outside of those top six, you mentioned Purdue and Michigan State. You said you have seven in. Which of those two is in right now and, and which is kind of on the outside looking in? So right now, um, playing in is Michigan State okay. right now. So I have them right now on that line, and we'll see how that shakes out. They've had a tough uh, – excuse me, a tough uh, battle so far in the conference. They almost knocked off Ohio State. And then Purdue, they're making some noise as well. But I'm taking a close look at those teams. We'll see how it all shakes out around the uh, league. But so far, that's what I have. All right, Autumn, we will, of course, keep an eye on your bracket as we head down the stretch. Autumn coming into studio – here tomorrow so we will see you in Chicago safe travels and thanks a lot for your time thank you so much see you all tomorrow got a few minutes left to talk coaches the coaching jobs have stood out so far this year where are you starting Trent uh, I got to start with the most surprising team to me and that's that's Purdue to, for them to be 17 and one after losing four starters losing a lottery pick in Jaden Ivey I mean it's remarkable what Matt Painter has done you talk about the development of Zach Eady magnificent um, the chemistry of the team I think this team is much they're, they're tighter they're more connected than they were last year that starts with the coaching staff recruiting players not just potential I mean they get guys that can play not just guys that might be able to play one day I mean you think about the freshman the the leadership the leash that he's given Braden Smith and Foster Lawyer um, he's got to be the front runner at this point for Big Ten coach of the year it's pretty amazing how they identify talent and of course there's been a lot of talk about Zach Eady and where he was ranked in the recruiting rankings and his is an unusual story but Braden Smith was a very lightly recruited player and for him to step in right away and be the point guard on a team that was ranked number one in the country for several weeks really speaks to his ability to plug the right guys into his system and not get wowed by stars trust his eyes yeah, not absolutely. others eyes and even think Trey Kaufman Wren I think is one of the more highly rated recruits and he redshirted, redshirted him, him. So. yeah he was telling me about Braden Smith and was saying that yeah, Braden Smith played high school ball an hour from West Lafayette, but he could not see him in person because it was during COVID. Yeah, that's or banned from scouting in person. He watched him on tape, watched four rated players and Braden Smith, and he said it was clear Braden Smith was that's the cool. the best of the five. Where are you going after him? Uh, Steve Peichel. Okay, at Rutgers, they hadn't made an NCAA tournament since '91, I believe, and then they make it in 2021. Made it last year. They're going back this year. He's established a culture there. And they know who they are. They embrace who they are. Gritty. They grind it out. And they just got to commit from a, a, with their highest recruit in five history, five-star yep. kid. So uh, the, the, they're in a great position. They're only going to maintain there, too. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, they're here to stay. Like, yeah. I think that's the clear message of this year as we debate, are they the second-best team in the league after losing two great players? You know, Geo Baker, Ron Harper were really good. And yep. yet and – yet, they're still here. I mean, he his culture is fabulous. Great home court advantage. So a lot to like about Rutgers. Who's next? Uh, Chris Collins. OK, this team uh, it, with Northwestern, they've completely changed their identity. You know, the, to I thought the hiring of Chris Lowry was really good. Now they're a top 15 defensive team in the country. So they're in a really precarious point in the season right now. Where do they go? But up to this point, I think he's done a terrific job, especially how they've bought in on the defensive side of the ball. You do worry a little bit about depth. They have For two sure. freshmen who are banged up right now. And so they only have eight healthy scholarship athletes. And when we see them having to postpone a game because of COVID, it does give There's you some worries sense. there for sure, yeah, but yeah. I like what they've done so far, and it'll Absolutely. be really interesting what, what the next half of the season, what entails there. Yeah, fascinating the way that they have kind of reinvented themselves. Got time for one more. Who else do you want to point out? Micah Shrewsbury. Okay, this is a guy, you see him mic'd up at times. Can we get him a mic'd up even more? I mean, you talk about a guy that you would love to play for. I mean, his, you know, how he motivates his team, how he's adapted to his personnel, I think has been remarkable. Very slow-paced team last year, but this year, you know, I think incorporating some NBA stuff with their spacing, relying on the three ball, giving the ball to Jalen Pickett, letting him wheel and deal and do his thing, and surrounding him with those shooters. I love to watch his teams play, and that's a big reason why I think he's one of the most impressive coaching jobs so far. It was interesting in talking to Greg Garb before the game yesterday, he was saying that the way that Penn State is built is atypical of a Big Ten team. For sure. They're, a little bit unusual, the, the heavy reliance on the three without a clear-cut post presence. They said it really makes them difficult because there's a different template when you're preparing 
for a typical Big Ten team. And these guys are a little different out of necessity. I don't know that this is necessarily the way Micah sees his program being five years from now. But right now, this is what he has. And, and man, he's turned into a great team. The best coaches are going to get the best out of what they have to work with. And he's doing that as well as anyone. Absolutely is. Again, we got more Big Ten hoops coming your way tonight. We will see you for the tip-off show for Ohio State and Nebraska. For Trent Meacham, I'm David Rebson. Have a great one.